Hi there, my name is Stella O'Malley and I'm a psychotherapist and I'm very happy to be bringing you this presentation on coping with grief and loss because I feel very often when somebody's hit with something very awful that happens in their life, they can feel derailed because they feel so isolated about the awfulness and they find that other people don't understand. And I'm hoping that by the end of this presentation that you have kind of some feeling of, yeah, like maybe something awful happened, but maybe there might be a road ahead if you can deal with grief in your own personal way. And it's it's one of the tragedies of life that, you know, some people sail through life and some people get much harder cards. And sometimes terrible, terrible things happen to really nice people and nobody's figured out why. And religions have been built around this. Philosophy has been built around it. Psychology and science. And still nobody's figured out why do bad things happen to good people? And why do good things happen to bad people? And why do we live? Why do we die? We don't know where we came from. We don't know where we're going. And it's, it's incredibly difficult to get your head around when it happens to you. And hopefully I'll do my small bit in helping you make sense of it with this presentation. It is brought to you by Keep Well Tipperary. And that's Tipperary County Council. And it's a Keep Well campaign that's brought to you with thanks to Healthy Ireland, an initiative of the Government of Ireland, with funding from the Healthy Ireland Fund and the Slauncher Care Fund delivered by Pubble. And um, it's a great campaign that we should keep well in these challenging times. And I think it's really important. I am a psychotherapist. I'm based in Offaly. And I often give talks and I, you know, do a lot of writing and and. Um, I've written a few books on different parts of well-being and and mental health, parenting and things like that. And so I, I have studied a lot around mental health. And one thing about loss and grieving, because this presentation isn't just about grieving, it's about loss too. And sometimes loss can come in a very large scale and sometimes it can be the loss of, for example, people's loss of social life at the moment, people's loss of friendships at the moment, loss of work. There's a lot of ways to lose. So loss is when something of value is gone. While grief is a total response to an emotional experience related to loss. So something might go and then the grief you feel is the aftermath, that kind of extraordinarily shook feeling when you're grieving something. Bereavement is a specific subjective response to loved ones and mourning is the behavioral response. And so I do think that back in the day when we used to go into mourning, I do think there was real merit in it because going into mourning and maybe wearing the black band, although it might have been very constricting for a lot of people, it could also have been very freeing for a lot of people because they were allowed to grieve in their own process. And you kept your your grieving clothes on or maybe just a black band. But in a way, it's a kind of it's a sign to the world that you're fragile. And I really think some people could do with it. I really think we should consider bringing it back. Not for any other reason than to give respect to the grieving process, because it's such a difficult process. And if you're going through it, if there's loss or there's grief in your life, give yourself some space to work through this very special, very difficult time so that you can come out of it. And, you know, you'll be different, you'll be changed, but that you do have space to live on. A lot of people, when they've gone through a very large loss or grief, they don't find a reason to move on or to live. What is the point? So they go through the motions. And if if you can tap into a reason for living, sometimes it's in 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 memory and in in deference to the life of the person who's gone. So grief is a very natural response to loss. The loss can be death of a relationship loss of a relationship, job, health, the loss of your health, big one, loss of money, a miscarriage, pet, lost dreams, lost hopes, lost ambitions, ambitions, serious illness, a loss of a friendship or safety after a tragedy. And of course, the biggest one, the loss or the grief of a, a loved one who has died. And the, these are such big events that the war, it can be shocking that the world keeps turning. And you know that poem, Stop All the Clocks. It's such a good evocation of why you we feel so shocked that the world, the cars still roll around, the sun still rises, people still get up and go ahead with their life when you are literally have been stunned by a blow. 
And grief is the emotions and pain we feel when someone or, or something we loved is taken away. And we grieve, grieve in different ways. And how you do gr grieve depends on your personality. For some people, it's a coping style. For some people, it's a life experience. For some people, it's their faith. And for some people, the nature of the loss. It depends how you grieve. So one person might have had their husband, for example, taken away from them from a car accident, a shock car accident that came from another. Another person might have their husband taken away from them from a, after 17 year debilitating illness. Very different types of grief are going to enact at that place. Very different experience, very different emotions to work with. The person who's had the very long illness might have a huge amount of distress and a huge amount of lost lives, a huge amount of, of, of distress about how it all panned out and how difficult it all was and how, how difficult an awful lot of people were in dealing with the sickness. While somebody with the car accident, the shock of it, that they could feel very anxious, they could feel they can't trust anything, they could feel anything could happen, completely different reactions because there are such different events. So there's no comparing your grief or loss with somebody else's. We do know it takes time and it can't be forced and it can't be hurried. And while you can get support with counselling and therapy, it won't be support for you to be happy. It'll be support for you to make sense of it so that you can continue on in your way in the grieving process. So the, the removal or, or absence of an important object from an individual's life, it's a state of being without something one has had. And loss can be actual or potential. Sometimes it's the potential loss of your job that can keep people up at night. And sometimes they can lose their job and you think potential loss of the house and they keep on going into the potential loss rather than the actual loss. And in a way, it's like a delay of grieving. I don't want to delay the I don't want to grieve the loss of my job. So I'm going to jump ahead and worry about the future worries because I can't really face the sadness of today's worry. The more individuals have invested emotionally in a purpose, in a person, object or aspect of self the more threatened they are likely to feel as they anticipate that loss. If you're very enmeshed with something and then you lose it, it could be your job, it could be your friendship, a relationship, then you, you kind of lose yourself when you lose it. So a couple that are incredibly enmeshed together will find it much more difficult to move on without each other than a couple who've perhaps got more separate lives. The thing about grief is it's filled with strange feelings. The strange feelings of grief are actually a sane response to grief. The following examples are all symptoms of normal grief. Distorted thinking patterns where you're just kind of, the, it feels like you've gone a bit mad because there's, there's no coherence to your thinking. Crazy, irrational thoughts, fearful thoughts, feelings of despair and hopelessness, out of control feelings, feeling completely numb, feeling happy, feeling released, feel, feeling liberated. So many strange responses to grief. There's no telling how you're going to respond. And so I urge you to give yourself a break and let yourself be whoever you are in your grief. So here's a few more examples of different responses people, catalogued, documented responses people have had to grief and loss. You feel distracted as though you can't focus on anything or, or other than your loss or grief. You feel you have to conserve your energy to deal with the emotion and the stress. You feel as though things one, you once enjoyed now feel meaningless or unimportant. You feel you disengage from activities because they remind you of your loved one. You feel anxious about seeing people or any social interaction. You can't face it. You feel anxious about running into grief triggers. You don't want to walk down that road because you used to go to that cafe. You feel anxious about becoming emotional in front of others because you're afraid of opening the tap and the fountain might come out. You no longer feel like a capable and competent person. You lose faith in yourself. You lose faith in life. You longer, the world no longer feels safe or reliable. It feels safe and comfortable not to push yourself and you, your world becomes much more narrow because you're fearful. Engaging activities feels like a betrayal or as though you're moving on. Being happy feels like a betrayal. Laughing feels like a betrayal. You think you will feel better in time, so you decide to stay at home and wait it out. Be careful of the narrowing of your life. While it's very important that you do it as you attend to yourself and you go into that private, very private space for grief, do become conscious, if at all possible, 
that if you keep narrow and keep in a very safe place, your life will become very monotonous. And I don't know how much longer, you know, it depends on the person. One person might be a year, another person might be five years. You could feel very depressed about the narrowness of your life. So you do have to be aware of how narrow you might have become or how constricted you've become. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross did a brilliant kind of concept around grief and she called it the five stages of grief. And so the five stages can come at you in any different sequence. For example, you might start with denial. You first hear of the loss or the grief. Maybe it's the loss of a relationship and you're thinking that didn't happen. No way. He'll be back to me. So you might avoid things. You might feel confused. You might feel delighted. And then because you're in shock, you might feel fearful. Same with death. You might just say, no, no, that's not true. And then you can move into anger and frustration and irritation and pure anger. And you might look for somebody to blame and become very, very angry about the sequence of events that led up to the loss or the separation or the grief or the death. After the anger, and that can be a very strong period and it can last years where you're just motivated to get people because somebody has done you wrong and has wrecked your life. You can move into depression where you feel completely overwhelmed, helpless. The, you know, you, the fight has gone in you and you're defeated and you're down. Then you can move the, the fourth stage is bargaining and you try to find some meaning. So you might turn to God or you might reach out to others. You might, you know, start a campaign. For example, if your child was knocked over, you might start a campaign to get more safety on the roads because you need to get some meaning out of the senseless death that has occurred in your life. Or you might get some meaning out of if you've lost somebody to suicide, you might get try and get some meaning around, well, what we need to know more about suicide. And you're right. Very often we can improve things, but it's very much a stage of your grieving process. And it's a, it's a good stage. You know, they're all good stages because you need to go through them. And then acceptance. Finally, accepting what are your options now that your life has been shook, it has not gone the way you wanted, you're in a new world, you're in a new planet, a new normal, as they say, and you try to deal with your life in the, in the new way. Now, you might not go through all the stages. You may go straight to denial to acceptance. You might not touch any of the other stages. It depends on the person. But it is a good working theory to work with because... It, um, a lot of people have found it very interesting and a lot of people find it doesn't go sequential. So it doesn't necessarily start with denial. It might start with anger or it might start with depression and then go up to anger and then over to denial. Think This is not happening. It's just not happening. And then you might go to bargaining and you start kind of making these kind of deals with yourself, with life, with the universe, with the divine all to kind of get your head around something horrific that should never have happened. Some people have developed Kubler-Ross's um, five stages of grief and into seven stages of grief. It's similar, but I think it's it's interesting to have a look at it. And the addition is the shock and the testing. They're the two extra stages. So one, you can go into shock, initial paralysis at hearing the bad news, then denial. Try to avoid the depth of the bad news and you, you hope that something will happen to change the new bad news. Anger, a huge outpouring, like I said, that can last many years of emotion about how this isn't fair and this should not be. Then bargaining, you're looking for some sort of solution, something, anything to kind of gather from the wreckage of your life. Then depression, an absolute overwhelming realization of what's happened. That can be such a sad stage. And it can be such a hard stage. And that's the stage of any stage where you try and seek support with a counsellor. Somebody kind and compassionate at that point that can make such a difference to you. It's such a sad and lonely place. Testing is when you're trying to look for realistic. Should I move house? Should I move in with somebody? What should I do? So you might test a few situations. You might do some kind of unusual ideas because you're kind of thinking I need a new life. And then finally acceptance and you find a way forward and you find a way forward with the grief still in you, you know, and the sadness still in you and the event has happened. So it's, you know, the body keeps the score, but there's more than grief still in you. You've on some level assimilated it, changed 
and a moving on in your life, not 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 leaving anybody behind. And I do want to say that some people are afraid to be happy, that they're afraid to move on. They think if they move on, they're not respecting the person they loved, who they've lost. And I, I would turn that on its head and say they'd be delighted if you could move on. They would want you to be happy. So be careful of that sort of thinking. So any loss can cause grief. For example, the loss of a friendship, often not used enough in comparison and in psychoeducation, that people can be devastated. I remember a woman I knew and her, her husband of 50 years died and I was, you know, passing on my, my consoling kind of words to her. I met her on the street and she said, well, to be honest, my, my best friend died a month ago and uh, that's hit me much harder than, than my husband, like, you know because she was that close to her best friend. It wasn't a reflection on her husband. It was a reflection on the depth of the relationship with her, with her friend. So the loss of a friendship can be a very, very big event. Loss of health. When somebody gets a very serious diagnosis, they go very much go into a grieving stages. Where there's anger, there's bargaining, there's denial, there's all of them. Loss of a job, especially if your identity is very much wrapped up in it. Death of a loved one. Loss of a pet. Remember when I was a child, me and my uh, me and my brother were kind of hard chores, and my dad had written into the evening press his dog died, and the the evening press was a paper in Dublin in the eighties and longer. But um, we used to get the evening press. My dad had written into the evening press to say he wanted to start a bereavement group for um, people who'd lost a pet. And me and my brother, to my shame, were absolutely laughing about it and saying, oh, my God, did you get any responses? And he was right. All these years later, you know, I think he was right. He was right. Loss of a pet for some people is so devastating. It really was. A divorce breaking up, that is a momentous event. And it definitely people go through the stages of grief with that. And loss of financial stability can be a very, very derailing thing. So you think, we think, we all think it's going to be this well-staged kind of like a train. You're going through one to the other and it's not. You go from ba anger back to denial and then you go forward to bargaining and then you might go back to anger and then over to depression. And then you might go into a place of acceptance and you might go back to anger. It depends on you. You will be all different stages at different times. And yeah, give yourself the freedom to do it your own way. You know, there is, there's no true way to do it. The just the most important thing that you could do is to do it your own way, do it kind of privately. Use a lot of self-compassion because if anything will get you through, it'll be self-compassion. And be aware that anger, anger at the person who's gone, anger at the life you didn't have, anger at the authorities that you feel did you wrong, Anger is really much very often a, a big part of grief and it needs to be acknowledged, really. As Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who is the woman who developed the, the original five stages of grief, she said, and I love these words, the reality is that you will grieve forever. You will not get over the loss of a loved one. You will learn to live with it. You will heal and you will rebuild yourself around the loss you have suffered. You will be whole again, but you will never be the same nor should you be the same, nor would you want to. So you let it kind of assimilate into you and it's part of you forever. The, the poet uh, Philip Larkin had that lovely line, what will survive of us is love. And your love for that person that you've lost, that will survive within you and within other people. And that's what survives of any of us. So, so the more you can be conscious of that, maybe the better. As Rose Kennedy says there, it has been said that time heals all wounds. I do not agree. The wounds remain. In time, the mind protecting its sanity covers them with star tissue and the pain lessens, but it is never gone. I think it's a really nice image that we have our wounds. They're in our heart. They might be covered. There is a scar tissue. There is a kind of toughness almost or even a tenderness in that spot. But they live within me. And I roll on and I never let it go. And yet I learned to live onwards without always looking backwards. Because, you know, we, we have no other choice but to kind of 
to take things at a slower pace and a more reflective pace after we've gone through a great hardship. So there's a nice, there's a nice kind of quote here, the real rules of life after loss. If somebody makes you laugh, you spend time with them. If somebody makes your heart beat a little faster, you let them. If your friends don't understand you, you let them go. If you want to date, you date. If you don't want to date, you don't date. If people tell you time heals all wounds, don't listen to them. And if someone is telling you how to live your life, remember your life after loss is nobody's business but your own. And I say that, you know, with the, you know, the well awareness that I, I'm sitting here saying it. I'm hopefully not telling you how to live after loss. I'm hopefully reminding people that there's a way of coping after grief and loss. And it's your way. And you find your road. And it can be a very sad lo load. And there can be very little meaning attached to it. And sometimes there's lots of meaning attached to it. But it's yours to kind of assimilate into your life. And... In many ways, I think it's so tragically unfair that some people have such hard times that all you can do is these are the cards I got. And now I have to play with them and I've just got this life. And no matter how awful the events of your life have unfolded, you can still capture some beauty in a day. You can still look at the sunset. You can still put new sheets on your bed. You can still do little things to make your life that little bit nicer. And so it doesn't matter when we see the depths of awfulness humanity has gone through, like the Holocaust, and terrible famine and war. And people have gone on and they've still managed to capture some joy in their life. And that's, I would say, I would urge anybody who's gone through terrible distress to consider how they could capture any distress. As Kathy Lamb says, but grief is a walk alone. The solitary nature of grief is often understated. Others can be there and listen, but you will walk alone down your own path at your own pace with your sheared off pain, your raw wounds, your denial, your anger and bitter loss. You'll come to your own peace, hopefully, but it will be on your own in your own time. Don't let it hurry. Don't let yourself be hurried. Don't let anybody else hurry you. Try to find your own space. And sometimes you might find yourself stuck and you might reach out for help. And sometimes you might think I need to be stuck right now. I, I haven't got it in me to develop any further. So I hope you benefited from this talk. It's something that matters a lot to me, that there's people outside in the world right now in deep grief, in deep loss, trying to make sense of a terrible place that they should never have been and I hope that they got some solace from this from this initiative that Keep Well Tipperary have brought a campaign brought to you with thanks to a Healthy Ireland an initiative of Government of Ireland with funding from the Healthy Ireland Fund the Slange Care Fund and delivered by Bubble. Thank you very much. <laughs>